Psalms chapter 24. Wow, both the McMahon ladies playing that song. That's good. I like that. So I asked one of our teenagers today was walking with Kayla, and I said, do you know which one that is? He said, oh, yeah. Teenage guys know whether they're Kayla or Megan. <laughs> Their parents don't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, no, they, they do. It's one or the other. <laughs> Psalm 24 in your Bible, if you'd find that, and, and I'm going to use some scripture today. You know, it's interesting, I read a lot of old, uh, just as much old stuff as I can get. Uh, I, I read almost nothing written since the 60s or mid-70s for sure. You find a book, of a history book or a biography of a famous American written in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, you can just about bet it's crooked. You just, you just don't want to read new stuff. And, and I'm not meaning some of you brilliant people shouldn't write books. I'm just saying um, we are in a culture that's corrupting truth. And we're, we're changing history. People that are writing books are doing their very best to destroy and dishonor greatness. And they're trying to make people that are nothing into something. And uh, I won't name them, but you see them. They're on TV and they're all the time in, in politics and People that have never done anything, stood for anything, couldn't, uh, couldn't accomplish anything with their life that would make a difference. And uh, they are lauded as the greatest, while people who really built something, the ones, the ones who interpret the Constitution are called great, while those who wrote it are called bad. That's a problem. But um, tonight, I'm, I'm just going to let me back to where I started in um, reading these sermons from the mid-1800s to early 1900s, very rarely do I see anyone in a sermon say, turn in your Bibles too? Because the audience knows their Bible. Yep. Right. And they'll just start saying, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell there. And everyone knows it's Psalm 24. And, uh, you know, that's how it was in the New Testament. They just say, as it is written, as it is written in the prophets. And, you know, one thing different between our culture and 100 years ago TV, TV and sports. We are sports crazy. Now you've got to decide what to do. It's between you and God and your family. But I, you ought to have something set up. No more time watching sports or playing sports than in your Bible or church. Just something. Set up some kind of a pattern. Uh, figure it out. Um, you know, talk to your kids. I don't, we've, got, we've always had a video game of some kind, usually the ones about like we, we, we just got a Mattel something or other video game. I'm, um, I'm joking. I don't know what, you don't even know what Mattel is. You people are so backwards. Uh, we got Pac-Man. Um, but whenever we did have somebody's reject video game they gave, well, you're still in shock over me saying no more sports than Bible, huh? You're panic stricken here. But um, we always put time limits. Can't do more than an hour a day in your, in your video games. And if we're gone for a day, that doesn't mean two hours the next day. That just means you're cleaner than you would have been. Uh, we, we regulated things like that. And uh, you say, what do your kids think about it? Never asked them. Never did occur to me to ask my kids' opinion. Uh, the opinion is, do you want two helpings of broccoli or one? <laughs> anyway, all right. So let's just read Psalm 24. I'm not starting off on a very good foot tonight. But that's all right, because I've read this sermon, and I like it already. <laughs> this, I, they are my sermons, all right? I don't preach anybody else's sermon. I steal lots of other information for my sermon, but they're all mine. Psalm 24, let's stand for a minute. If you wouldn't mind getting your phones turned to silent or something, um, so they're quiet. Uh, I won't be long tonight, no later than midnight. Uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. Everything. We talked about that during stewardship month. For he hath founded it, verse 2, for he found, founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Who is it? He's asking. It's going to get close to God. Well, you've got to ask the Pope or, you know, Donald Trump or somebody. I don't know who. Maybe we ought to just read the Bible. Let's just read the next verse. How's that? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord, righteousness from the God of his salvation. 
That verse 1 is where we're going to start tonight. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness there of the world, and they that dwell therein, everything starts with God. Let's pray. Father, teach us tonight, and, and there'll be a lot of scripture and a lot of ideas, and we pray for help. Everybody here has got different needs. Uh, those raising children, like Brett talking with he and Jen and their boys, or those in, in, in Brooklyn as well, and then those who have grandkids and those who are not even married yet. May we get our thinking and our philosophies right here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, I talked about our church's, uh, the, our purpose as a church, and the purpose of our home, and, and the, or the goal, the vision, the vision of our home, the vision of our church, the vision of our, the vision for our community, for our state, for our country. Tonight, I want to talk about um, our, um, our, our world view. What is, and again, this is, this, uh, there's a lot in here for everybody, but this is relating to Christian education. What's our view of the world? And who's giving us that view of the world? Far, far too much of what we think we know, we learned from news and, and uh, TV shows. And, uh, you know, it's amazing if all you know about classic literature is what you saw when they made those books into movies, <laughs> you don't know. They changed them. You know, if, if all you know about the story of Moses delivering Israel is what you saw with Charlton Heston, <laughs> you missed it. You know, I saw somewhere, I don't know where it was, I saw somebody in an advertisement for a, a new movie about the resurrection or something. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be slightly interested in watching it. Some years ago, many years ago, the, the movie The Passion came out. I had people meet me, oh man, are you going to go see The Passion? No, I've been reading about it for 30 years. I've read the original. I don't need Hollywood's perversion of it. Now, I'm not against it. I don't care if somebody else puts it on or makes it. And someone said, I just cried through the whole thing, changed my life. But I don't see them in church. It changed their hour. It didn't change their life. It affected their emotions for the moment. It did not change their life for an eternity. And that's what we ought to be concerned about here. And again, uh, if, if you're looking forward, to, if, if that movie was on this afternoon, you watched it, God bless you. I'm not pick. I, I, I have no idea. I just saw it advertised somewhere. I think I was at the Beals house watching a ball game and, and it was advertised or something. But, but anyway, Manny Pacquiao told me about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Sacred cow there. Can't do that. Uh, small sacred cow. But anyhow, proper, <laughs> proper. Uh, proper worldview. Uh, I want to talk to you tonight again dealing with education, but dealing with our church and us. Um, when we talk about history, what's our view of history? You say, well, history's history is history. Oh, no, no, no. Depends on who you hear it from because you didn't live it. Well, a couple of you. Um, but most of us didn't live it. So we are getting our view of history from someone. And that's why I say, you know, I, I see a new book on Thomas Jefferson. I'm not reading that. There were bunches of books written, by Tom, written on Thomas Jefferson um, 20, 30, 50, 70, 100 years ago. Why would I want to read a new guy's book that he has some new revelation? Um, I've got a, if, you, if you've read some new books on Jefferson, I've got a book that should be your follow-up called The Jefferson Lies. Documented, detailed proof to show all the lies people are telling about Jefferson today by a godly Christian author. But when we talk about our world view and, and what our view of life in general is, when I say world, I don't mean the globe, I mean our whole world. What is our view of this world? Example, what is our view of men? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. That's a good place to start with your view of man. In Romans 3.23, there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's your view of man? Well, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. Everything is God's. People say, well, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm my own person. I can make my own choice. You're not your own person. God gives you breath. God makes your heart beat. God keeps your brainwave straight. God keeps your little ear things jingling the right way so you don't fall into a wall. God keeps you where you are. You know, you just let one little thing go wrong. Ask Steve Rowe, right? One little thing. Ask Emily. Steve didn't know what was going on. <laughs> you know, you just, you just let your, 
arteries get clogged just a little bit. Let your heart, just like mine, let your heart, John Lewis will tell you, let your heart get off. Get that atrial fibrillation where your heart's off. Like taking two spark plug wires on your car and switching places. You want to know what atrial fibrillation is? Taking an eight-cylinder car, pulling two wires, throwing them, and then reversing two others. That's what it is, and then revving the motor. And um, if you see me up here sometimes kind of coughing a little bit, it's because it's just like your car. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get the dumb motor started. <laughs> the, the, the good news is it won't kill me. The bad news is they haven't fixed it. But uh, anyway, they say they're going to, but you know, you know how doctors are 42 years from now. But uh, what is our view of men? We're sinners. What's our view of the world? It belongs to God. We don't belong to this world. We're not brothers with the oak tree. Oak is something you make furniture of, from. Oak is something you cut up and burn. Oak is something you climb and build a treehouse for your kids. I don't know what else you want, whatever you want to do with oak. Oak, the tree, this world is, is God's. It all belongs to God, and God gave us dominion over this world. And it's not to abuse it, but certainly uh, not to worship it. What a dumb idea to worship a, a kangaroo rat. And could I tell you, science is usually way off. When we first started trying to get a church building built, we had to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for research, development, and protection of the Stevens kangaroo rat. Tons and tons of money. I can't even get to tell you how much money. And not just us, all the developers in this area. And you know what they found out after years and years of taking our money? There were no Stevens kangaroo rats in this area. And you know what else? They didn't give us any of the money back. They're just a bunch of stinking thieves. Uh, they might be sincere, but just because you're sincere doesn't mean you're not an idiot. I mean, those people that have dementia are sincere, and we love them. But you don't let them plan the course of society. What about our view of government? Think about this. Go to the book of Daniel sometime, and when God lays out the governments, the Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire, see what he describes them as. You know, every one of them is an animal. A devouring, violent beast. Every one. You know what government is? Government is a violent, devouring monster. That George Washington described government as a fire. That if you don't keep it in check, it will burn everybody up. Washington had the right view of government. Government is not your friend. Government is, is a, a horrible predator prowling around seeking to devour you, your medical coverage, your, your freedom, your future, your retirement, your pensions. That's government. Now, it's a necessary evil, but it's kind of like a, a real bad pit bull. Keep it on a chain with a shocker button. Well, I'd like to have a shocker on some government employees. Man, that would be fun. I wouldn't kill them, but it'd be fun. What about rulers? You want to study your Bible and find out what God talks about rulers? Nebuchadnezzar was called God's servant. He was a wicked man. Pharaoh, back in Moses' day, was, was ordained of God. God called Pharaoh into his place because he had a reason. L rulers are not accidental. Our president, our governor, they're not there. And God's up in heaven saying, oh, no, what are we going to do? God let them be there. God ordained them to be there. Now, let's hope he ordains something different next, all right? But uh, don't fear. Now, I'm going to give you half dozen quick views, things to think about. First of all, um, give you three thoughts, and you've heard us talk about Jim Beller, one of the best guys. He's in heaven now, but his wife's a widow. She'll be here at our ladies' conference, by the way. Um, Jim Beller wrote the book American Crimson Red. Very, very good book, well worth reading. But I heard him say one time, our worldview is one of three things. It's a pagan worldview. Now, a pagan worldview is this. You believe, or the world believes, that you do what you want, how you want it, as long as you want it, as long as you can get away with it, and when you die, you're dead. That's most of the world believes that. That would be a pagan worldview. Then there's the Catholic religious worldview. You read world history, and you go back through most of European history from the four to five hundreds all the way up to the 1600s, that whole era, 
and you'll see a merging of the church and the government whether it be Calvin and Zwingli or whether it be popes and, and Rome or the Byzantine, when, when Rome and, and uh, the Eastern Orthodox, the Byzantine Empire split off, all of it is based on a, a religious group meshing with a government group of total, absolute authority. And you read through history and they are their God. They act in the place of God. They've got total authority. And so one of the world views is all there. When you read a book on history, it'll be the view that government and religion merged together and they did all these things and accomplished all these things. And of course, that's, that's not us. The pilgrims and the Puritans basically believed the same thing as the Protestants did. If we, you were here um, not too long ago, we've talked about it, the there was the time of Christ, and then the church scattering, quickly spreading, and then there was um, the Bible-believing group, and then there's another group that wanted to the, the religious leaders to be in charge. You know what's great about Christianity? If you, I don't care if you're the, we're the first church you ever came to, and you, you learned the Bible here, you got saved here, and you've learned the Word of God here, you walk out the door, you're just as saved and just as right with God as if you stayed here. This church got no holds on anybody. This is... This is, uh, we believe in freedom of conscience. That's what Baptists have always believed. We're, we're independent people. That's what got America the First and Second Amendment to our Constitution. Freedom of speech, freedom of belief, freedom to bear arms, because it's nobody's business. Stay out of it. Long as I don't hurt you, leave me alone. And that's Bible doctrine, and that's been a Baptist doctrine all the way back from, from as far back as you can go. But there was a split of the Catholic Church and, and uh, the Bible-believing group, and the Catholic Church did have Bible, of course, but on occasion, but they were really knit with the government from Constantine on up through, and then the, the Catholic Church split with the, the uh, Protestant Reformation, and there was uh, Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and others. But the one thing, even the Protestant Reformation, many of them did believe the gospel, many of them did tell people how to get saved, and I'm not, I'm not talking about whether they're right or wrong about heaven and hell, but what they did is they kept that knit of government and church. And if you were, if you were in, um, in, uh, under the authority of uh, Luther or Calvin or Zwingli, the main big name reformers, and you didn't go to their church, you'd be banished or jailed or tortured. Countless millions of people were murdered simply because they wouldn't baptize a baby. They lost freedom of conscience. And so much of history is written from a total pagan view. Everybody do what you want, it's nobody's business. Then there's another view of, of world history that all focuses on the, the Catholic Protestant view. And then there is that group of weird people. By the way, if you want to go to the, to the uh, Patrick Henrys who would ride hundreds of miles at his own expense to defend a Baptist preacher who was jailed by Protestants, by Anglicans, who, uh, who the preacher said, I'm not taking license, I'll preach where I want, when I want, and I can preach this book if I want to preach this book. Patrick Henry stood with the Baptists. And through he and Adams and others, that's where we got our First Amendment, and that's where we got our, our Bill of Rights and where we got our freedoms. Uh, the, the idea that there was a religious belief forced on everyone, that's... That's where we got the Establishment Clause. If I could just take a moment and give you a, a little history, and I'm not an ultimate historian, but I read and I listen and I study, but the, reason, the Establishment Clause that the, that the government will not establish any religion. And that's what the, the wicked crowd today says, that means you can't have a Christmas tree on the White House lawn. That is as dumb a thing as you can come up with. You can't have a cross on a mountain in San Diego. That's not what the Establishment Clause is. You go back prior to our founders and all the way back to the uh, first century, uh, the first uh, thousand years, 800 years, um, the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, they made you be an Anglican, or they made you be a Catholic, or they made you be a, a Lutheran, or they made you be Episcopalian, and if you weren't, you were going to jail. That is a government establishing religion. For us to put a cross on a hill is not establishing a religion. It's called freedom. 
And when our founders wrote those words, they said, this government will, government will not compel you to join any church. That's the establishment clause. And like I said earlier during the is the only thing we've got, you know, nowhere in America, everybody in America believes in freedom of religion. Lutherans are not forcing you to be a Lutheran. Now we'll let the Muslims get enough hold, they'll start forcing you. But in American, traditional American religions here, Mormons aren't going to make you be a Mormon. Jehovah Witnesses aren't going to make you stand on the street corner holding the newspaper. And Baptists may knock on your door and witness to you, but you know what? It's your choice. Believe it or not believe it. Amen. And that is what America was founded on. Yeah. The only place in America we've got the Establishment Clause being violated in its original intent is the public school system. Because the temples, called schools, with high priests called teachers, with religious literature that denies God, denies the Bible, and denies Christianity, our public schools won't even let scientific evidence supporting creation in their schools. They are scared to death of facts. When I first got saved in 1975, I read something called Acts and Facts, a group of Christian scientists who'd go to the, the universities in Southern California, Dwayne Gish and Henry Morris and other famous scientists, and they just go to the university and say, could we have a debate with your, uh, your science staff, your evolution staff, your, your uh, whoever, you know, their, their staff that taught whatever, from astronomy to botany to microbiology. And, and of course, the, they'd call all their students into the biggest theaters, and, and they're going to feed these Christians to the professors every time. I'd read, the, I'd read the reviews on it every time. By the time the lecture's over, the students are applauding the, preach, the Christians. Not preachers, just Christian scientists who were shredding these people who denied God and denied the Bible and denied creation. And, and they'd say, now you come and you can't bring a Bible, you can't bring religion, you can't talk about Jesus. No problem, we'll do it. And they talk science and wear these guys out. Finally, after about 10 years, I noticed they quit printing those things, those acts and facts things, their stories. You know why? No university would debate them anymore. They just wore them out with science. I mean, with space. You, you get looking at space, space will eat up an evolutionist. Space is awesome. The heavens declare the glory of God. And all you've got to do is start studying that, and you're going to realize, whoa, there is a God in heaven. And the more scientific and the smarter you get, the more awesome God becomes. Nothing like it. There is a third view of the world, and that's been the traditional Baptist view, that Romans 14 says, every man will give account of himself. You are a free agent, and you have a right to follow God or not. You have a right. You want to carve a tree into a statue and worship it? God will let you. And so will we. Baptists are not people who go around grabbing people by the neck and forcing them into religion. We'll raise our children up, teaching our children what we believe. When our kids get 16, 18 years old, 20 years old, they got to decide. They really do, and I believe that. And very rarely do young people who get properly introduced to Christianity and the Bible, do they go off denying the whole thing. And they may, they may wade in, out, in and out of the world a little bit, but very, very few go denying the Bible. And just Look, you get introduced to this book, you just say, that's really amazing. It's just an amazing book. Roger Williams is said to be the first one who talked about separation of church and state a long time before Jefferson. But actually, Mino Simons was a Mennonite. He wrote about it in the 1550s. And he drew lines, and that's where they'll say they've always been. The Mennonites and the Anabaptists were very close in those days, and they, the, those philosophies flowed. The idea that government took care of government stuff, punishing bad people, and church took care of preaching the Bible, and you left each other alone. Wasn't the church's job to punish bad people? Wasn't the government's job to control religion? That's separation of church and state. I don't go down the street arresting people who are bad. I'd love that. Man, I'd be arresting all kinds of people. You didn't read your Bible today? Handcuffs. 
You didn't date your wife, take her out, spend some money on her? Yeah, flog you. <laughs> but, but the church isn't the one set up to punish evildoers. Romans 13 says, Wilt there not be afraid of the powers? The government is set up by God because we're a stupid, wicked people. We need a government. But it's none of their business to tell us what to preach, how to preach, when to preach it, or how to raise our children, or what to teach our children. And we, as the people of God, it's none of our business to go in and make all of that. That law shouldn't be 25. That speed limit should be 35. It's not our job. Now, as a citizen, you have rights. You know, the laws aren't good in America. By the way, America is such an amazing place. Do you know nowhere else in the history of the world can you find a country like ours? Hey, go to Iraq and complain about the ruler. You know the things I have said about our government rulers? If I did that in Baghdad, I'd be seeing Jesus. What a great country we have. Nothing like it. Now let me give you some things as we talk about proper view, just real quickly, the proper view of man. Three thoughts. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Who's teaching our children that? Where do we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? And without this book, you can't answer any of those questions. You can't. There's no way. Where did we come from? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Down about Romans or Genesis 1, 26, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female, created them. And God gave them dominion over the earth and the plants and the animals. Where did you come from? God. God made you. Romans or the Revelation tells us that why are we here? We're here for his glory and his praise. Why are we here? We're here to glorify God. We're not here to make money. <coughs> Someone says, I've, I just, uh, I've got big dreams. going to make money. And, to knock it off. It's like me having dreams for your cat. <laughs> not bad, a bad idea. Somebody's cat was sitting on the back fence of our yard years ago and statute of limitations long past, <laughs> howling. And uh, I just took a bottle and just threw it at the back fence just to scare it, make it run away. It hit that cat right square. I, felt, I like cats. I felt really bad. I just wanted to scare it. I didn't want to take it out. But it did, it did continue to howl on our fence. And so I, I'd go put little saucers of milk out there and make up for it. <laughs> Where did we come from? See, what is the proper view of man? You take the kids, several thousand of them in Elsinore High, and scattered around the high schools and junior high and elementary schools. Where did we come from? Just like one of, the, one of Brett's kids. Glad that we tell me we came from a monkey. Anybody believes they were a monkey once? That is really beyond stupid. You have to go to college a long time to think of something that idiotic. Why are we here? Not to make money, not to make me happy. I'm here to make God happy. And as I make God happy, if he sees fit to give me some things, then that's kind of God. Some of you, God's given you the ability to make money. Some of you, God's given you the ability to organize and help other people with their work or their home. Some of you are amazing lovers of people and you're just generous and kind and giving of yourselves. God made us all different, but all of it is for his glory. Getting the proper view of mankind and where are we going? I don't know about you, but I'm going to heaven. The Bible says Jesus is coming again. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. If you're not, you're going to hell. Well, I don't know if I agree with that. It doesn't matter what you would think. It matters what he said. Amen. Proper view of man. Secondly, the proper view of America. The divine and unique nation. Who's teaching your children about their country? You know, the schools of America are telling your children, if they're in a public school system, that America is a bad country, a greedy country that's taken advantage of people all over the world, and we are rich because we've made other people poor. Now that's about as stupid as saying your grandma was a chimpanzee. You go around the world and see what they're wearing. They're wearing our clothes. You go around the world and, and uh, see what they want to be like. The world wants to be like us. The world loves America. We are supposed to have walls keeping people out. Duh, that means this is an awesome place. Not only freedom, but incredible prosperity. Well, the greatest freedom is freedom of conscience and freedom of religion and freedom from religion. That all, you know what's great about America? If you're poor, you can vote. 
If you own property, you can vote. And, and, and the way America was designed, if you're in the White House, you're supposed to only get one vote. Dead people are not supposed to vote in America. Now we've got dead people voting and superdelegates. How do you get a superdelegate? You have to be a Democrat to have a superdelegate. You know what a superdelegate is? Somebody who gives a lot of money to the Democrat Party so your vote counts more. That's not America. Somebody's messing with our kids' view of their country. We're going to talk about it in our junior, senior philosophy class, but what about someone who doesn't... Somebody lives in an apartment down here, and they vote on the bill, or not a bill, but on the bond issue that says all landowners are going to pay taxes to support the park. Mm. I live in an apartment, I don't pay any property taxes. And you live in a house and you pay property taxes and I get to vote on whether you pay extra taxes to support the park my kids play at. <laughs> it's called America. That's right. Amen. Come on. Yes, sir. And you lose that equal, yep. w equal rights. Yep. You lose that flag. Amen. Because where we came from, if you had money and land, you influenced politics. But if you didn't have money and land, your vote didn't count. And that's why we got a Declaration of Independence. Who's teaching our kids that? I'll tell you, if you want to do it in the logic of men, you who don't pay taxes have no right to vote taxes on me. And that is how I look at it. In myself, but not as an American. I've learned too much about America to think that way. Right. Amen. Because with all of the luxuries and blessings of this land come some awkward things. There are some difficulties that come. That's the proper view of America. No one with extra power is supposed to be able to make laws. That's how our country was made. Proper view of morality. The right and wrong established by God. Do you know... No eight or ten people, or nine people, men or women, I don't care how old they are, how wrinkled they are, none of them have a right to say what's moral and immoral. That's right. Amen. That says what's moral and immoral. Morality is established right here. And I don't care if our judges said, take those ten commandments down off the wall of that school, they're still on the wall of your heart. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 2 says, that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. We know right from wrong. It's in our heart. Right. And no stupid judge that says you, that the, the, the logic of the judge that they really wrote down, they said you cannot have those things on the wall of school because it might be that a student would read those Ten Commandments. And if they read them, they might feel compelled to obey them, and that would be wrong. They've been to college too much. And they've been away from their Bible too much. The proper view of morality, understand this, it doesn't matter what I want. It matters what God says. I'm to love, look, let me just get real pointed here. I'm supposed to love my wife whether she treats me good or not. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Jesus loved you and me when we were pretty bad and when we are pretty bad. That's morality. Morality lays out who we are, what we are, our roles in the home, our roles in the church. And if we don't keep the proper view of morals, we're going to be a mess. Who's teaching our children morals 20 hours a week in the public school system? Because they are learning. Understand that whether it's taught or not, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this a judgment. We are going to die. Quickly, proper view of the family. Who's teaching our young people what a family is? You know, every, I talked to Chew to the men a little bit. Every time you ladies argue and fuss and demean your husband, you're telling the kids that the authority doesn't matter. 
So if, it's, if you're going to fuss, go in the back room, close the door, turn the stereo on, and do sign language. <laughs> I'm not saying you're never going to differ, just differ with discretion. You ought to talk. I don't think you ought to talk. I you know, you, you uh, and I don't know anyone in this room, I'm being honest, I don't know one person in this room who yells at their spouse. But you yell at your spouse, you can't take those words back. That's the reason they'll be quiet in our house, not yelling. Because I don't have to take quiet back. And everybody made out in our house, we just yell until it's all solved. Oh, go ahead, you're crazy. Proper view of the family, proper view of knowledge. You know, our world today, I know often, and Christian people are doing this. They'll say, well, we're putting our kids in these schools because the academics are so good there. Is it academics your, you want your kids to have or knowledge? Because the accumulation of facts does not give you knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And so when we talk about who's educating our children, are they just getting a bunch of facts while well, they're getting a Christ-denying, moral-denying, family-value-denying, America-attacking philosophy of life? What are, what, what, who's, who's taking the view of our young people, their view of knowledge? Romans 1 says, because they knew what they knew of God was manifest in them and, they, and God had shown it to them, but because they didn't want it. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations. God gave them up. Just because you're smart doesn't mean God's not going to kick you out. God's not impressed with knowledge. God's impressed with the knowledge of God. We want to be smart. We have a good school. There are many good schools. We want our kids educated. There ought to be Christian doctors. There ought to be Christian engineers. There ought to be Christian men and women in every area of life. I'd like some Christian politicians. I just don't know if that can happen. But I do think we ought to be smart. The prophet wrote, we, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. We need a proper view of authority. We need a proper view of nature. On and on. So many things. But here's the, the summary. Unless... We get our view right. Our conclusions are wrong. Amen. Tuesday and Friday, our boys will be at a basketball tournament. You know what's going to happen? We're going to be in the bleachers. And our view of a given call will be the right view. <laughs> Isn't that right? Have you ever seen someone say, what is that ref thinking? And then the TV camera is, comes in from this side, and you think, oh, that's what he saw. You know why? Because your view wasn't right. Famous preachers in a courtroom, he was called in to be a test a witness in a, he was a witness of an accident. The guy said, Tell us what you saw. I saw this car hit that car. What color was the car? There's a blue car. What color did the car did it hit? It hit a black car. All right, I called another guy. I said, no, it wasn't a black car and a blue car. It was a gray car and a whatever color. And they argued and argued, and they found out both of them were wrong. Because from this view with the light glaring, and from this view with no light glaring or the goofy lights, and, you know, the whole thing was a mess because their view was wrong. Have you ever had a, not lately, but you know, you go back 20 years ago, had the sonogram, and the doctor said, it's going to be a girl. And then, shazam, a boy was born. Everybody's disappointed, you guys. You know why? The view was wrong. Not, they don't do that anymore. When we start talking about our children, We've got to be very careful what their view is. By the way, when you start talking about eternity, we better know what our view is. Because I grew up in a very good home. My dad had left. My mom remarried a Catholic who would basically been excommunicated because his wife was a drunk and she ran off. And, but he went to the Catholic Church faithfully Christmas Eve. And, uh, and um, he was a faithful Catholic. My mom was a faithful Lutheran. She didn't go at all. But she got confirmed, and that's the home I grew up in, a good home. 
work ethic and honesty. Man, if you lied, you got beaten to death. You can tell who, who didn't lie. I lived, but I didn't get caught. But Somebody asked me if I was a Christian. And honestly, the song Brother Ron led at the end of the congregation singing, Onward Christian Soldiers. I had sung that in some church. And I'm with a teenage friend. I was in ninth grade. And this guy, we're at a park, and they had some kind of concert. And this guy said, if you're a Christian, raise your hand. I raised my hand. The girl that was with me looked at me and said, you're a Christian, Bruce. And I looked at her, and honestly, I thought, do you think I'm a heathen? Am I wearing a loincloth? Do I not like the Dodgers? I mean, I knew who Deacon Jones is. And some of you guys that are old know who Deacon Jones is. And he wasn't a church member. <laughs> I mean, I knew Muhammad Ali when he was Cassius Clay. Court, wait a minute, am I a Christian? You know why I was so shocked at her question? My view was wrong. And I got looking at my Bible and realized this book's view of me was that I was a sinner. And this book explained to me the proper view of God that he was so holy, a sinner could not get into heaven. And so between God's holiness and my sinfulness, I knew I was in big trouble. And then this guy showed me in the Bible where as a sinner, if I died, God could not let me into heaven, but God was obligated morally to throw me into hell. Suddenly my view changed. And so it's so important because that was when I decided I wanted to find out how to get, how to get saved. And it was simple. Christ died for me. He offered me a free gift. All I had to do was receive it. And he'd save me. I didn't have to join a church. It wasn't a church to save me. It was Jesus that saved me. I didn't need communion or baptism or confirmation or catechism. I didn't need a bar mitzvah. I didn't need a priest, a pope, a rabbi, a reverend. I just needed Jesus. And at 10 o'clock at night, I bowed my head and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. And I'm asking you to save me. And I was saved that night in a city park, not even a church. And little by little, my view on everything else started lining up. My view on morals this morning, I just closed this this morning thinking about churches and people and I was thinking about uh, and you that are in the staff here and you that are active in ministry. I wrote a note to the preacher, preacher's wife and the preacher had left her and she's trying to pay the bills and raise three kids on her own. I sent her a text, let her know my wife and I was put it for Mrs. Goddard and me. Uh, we're praying for you, which want you to know we love you and we care about you. And a bunch of us got money together so they'd have a Christmas. I wrote to another preacher's wife whose husband, whose husband had left her. And I wrote to a preacher's wife who the preacher had died. And I thought about First Baptist Church in Long Beach for quite a while this morning without a pastor. Since we've been here, my wife and I came in 1982, four pastors have come and gone to First Baptist Church in Long Beach. And I thought about the widows there, and I thought about the teenagers there, and I thought about the, the people struggling, and who was in the hospital praying for those that are, that are having ill health, and, and who cared if somebody's heart was broken. My view gets aligned the more I read my Bible. People matter. You know, the ministry is not a job. The ministry is a responsibility to people that you owe. And I don't have the liberty to take a job that offers me a raise. You know, there's too many people in the hospital and going to the hospital and, and should be in the hospital. <laughs> Helps your view. Help your view as a wife. You know, ladies, let me challenge you. Go through your Bible. If you don't know how to do it, call me. I'll help you. Find every verse in here you can find out what a wife's supposed to be. It'll fix your view. And you guys, don't look at all the verses a wife's supposed to look at. You look at the verses on what a man's supposed to be. I, I read what a wife's supposed to be and my wife's not. Yeah, well, you're not supposed to look at those verses. The devil showed you those verses. <laughs> How about you parents? Why don't you go find every verse in the Bible what a parent is supposed to do for their children, toward their children, with their children, and get your view straight. Sometimes people don't understand what we do here and, and then they're not bad people they just they're up in the bleachers we're right down in the court what do you do with the broken heart what do you do with the wounded what do you do with those who've been abandoned and hurt and on and on and on God has a view 
Let's make God's view our view. And that will make things right. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. We're so grateful that you love us and you care about us and that your view is the right view. And Lord, we look to you tonight and pray that you'd help us get our perspective or our view based on you. As we think about our children and grandchildren, and those young people who ride our buses and kids in our neighborhoods, Lord, I again pray, sure love to have that school over there on Lemon Street. I'd love to have enough money to hire teachers and open a school up where we could bring in young people and give them the right view of the world, of the nation, of morals, of family, of right and wrong, of authority, of heaven and hell. I pray for your help for us who are married that we might get a biblical view of our marriage. Bless these young people. We've got a bunch of young people here in college and some headed to college real soon and some making decisions about their future. Help them to get a biblical view of their tomorrow. Bless us. Help us, we pray, Father, that we could see through your eyes and get a good, clear view of things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We'll just take a moment quietly standing. You take a moment alone with the Lord as the instruments play. <clears throat> How's your view? And what can you do to improve your view? You just want to take some time to pray tonight. That's what the altar's for. And ask God for help for your family, for your church, for your... Well, pray for your country. We need prayer. Now tonight, if you're not sure that heaven is your home, if you've got one doubt about whether you're saved, maybe you're not sure your view is right, what the Bible says, we sure want God's view on heaven and hell and forgiveness. It's not my view, it's not our church's view, it's the Bible's view, but over my left, Brother Beals at the altar, at the aisle there, you want to come up, shake his hand, slip up to me, if you want to get up to me, I'll have someone talk to you, if you're a lady, I'll have a lady talk with you, if you're a man, I'll have a man talk with you, but boy, it's so important. Your view of salvation is forever, it is vital that you get this view right. deacons, staff, leaders here. I didn't talk at all about it, but you better make sure your view of Baptist is right and your view of fundamental and Bible believing. And may, man, let's make sure we know what we believe. Let's keep this church on track. Father, we thank you for the time together here. Thank you for your book. And we pray you'd lead us as we go. and Help us in our homes. Bless our marriages. We've got sinners living in each home and we do dumb things, say things we shouldn't, we respond poorly and somebody's thinking one thing while we do another thing and we sure need your help. Our flesh gets weak and weary with health and age and sometimes we overreact or underreact and, and then we've got children and wonderful young people here in this room and how much they need good leaders. I pray you'd bless the weak as the Kids go to school and all the different schools as our young people. Many of them are going to be at a basketball tournament. May their, may their view of authority be your view. Guard their spirit, Lord. May they give, a, give their best and then guard their, their response. And We just ask for help. Help us to think right. We're, a, we're in a corrupt world. Bless us as we go. Bless our nation. Bless our, our leaders. We pray for judges that would be right and political leaders that would be right, that would guide our country in the right path. Bless we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll look for you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock.